doing some actual looking at some of the videos we talked last week, leaving off with the throwing, kicking, striking stuff. We've got some videos there. Then what I'd like to do this week is do some actual, you know, immersion of the videotaping, you know, and then we have one last activity that we're going to do, you know, with the lecture, and that is the, um, you know, locomotion we're doing the, you know, tumbling, you know, how do we control that when we are, you know, our body is a projectile. So we're getting close to the end of the lecture stuff, and more of what we're going to do from now on is going to be interacting. So we'll do some movements, we'll do some things like that. So, you know, we may not be here all the time. I know that we do have time over in the physiology lab that we can use. So we've got some time over there. We can spend doing some activities and videotaping as well. So the purpose we're looking for with, you know, developing, you know, the fitness adaptations for body mechanics and physiology is really how do we use this equipment to, you know, develop the movements, develop the activity, you know, so we have to really, in this position, think about muscular flexibility, strength, endurance, and, you know, think about how each of those elements can be developed. You know, so state the principles that should be followed when prescribing and engaging in exercises for flexibility. You know, thinking about the principles that should be followed when engaging and prescribing exercises for strength, for power, for speed, all of those things. We have to think about how do those differ? So, you know, when we think about engaging an activity for flexibility, what do we do with that? How does it differ from an activity where we're going to, you know, engage in exercise for strength development? What's, you know, what do we do with flexibility exercises? We'll start there. Okay, so how do we stretch? And how do we, how do we use our knowledge of human movement? and the anatomical and mechanical principles behind that to understand flexibility. What is flexibility? <laughs> well, so it's really range thinking about how far much will stretch, but it's the range of motion around a particular joint. But what controls the range of motion around a particular joint? The connective tissues. Okay, so the connective tissues, which are what? Yeah. Ligaments and the tendons. Okay, so ligaments and tendons. Are, are there different functionalities between ligaments and tendons as those connective tissues attached to joints? When we think about flexibility, because if we think about flexibility in terms of extending range of motion around the joint or to providing, you know, more flexibility to the muscle, is there, is there a difference? Can our muscle be tight? and we don't have to extend the range of motion? You know, so if we think about this, do, <clears throat> if we think about a muscle being tight, and is that going to affect more the tendon or the ligament connected to the force of the joint? So it's going to influence the tendon. You know, so a lot of what we think about is flexibility doesn't really match itself in true limits of range of motion in the sense that our ligaments are saying, no, you can't go through there. Our bones are saying, you don't have that permissible range of motion. It's the muscles being tight. And why are the muscles tight? As we talked about last week, it's usually the you know, imbalance in the posture. It's that imbalance in that muscular balance around the joint. You know, so a lot of times, one of our first avenues to addressing flexibility problems is to address the balancing of the muscular recruitment around a joint. Because if we've got a certain muscle group that is constantly, you know, tight and under strain, is that because the, the joint itself is out of position? Possibly. You know, we may have an injury situation where we might have, you know, something where we've got a ligament tear or, you know, a bone that has, you know, been broken and some anomaly has occurred. But more often than not, most of the time it's due to the fact that we have an imbalance in the opposing musculature. So when you think about muscles, we, we often tend to think about them being exclusively on their own. So we think about the biceps being responsible for only the bicep function. But the biceps is also responsible for influencing and creating the opportunity for available motion at the triceps. 
So if our biceps is tight, what's going to happen to the triceps motion? It's going to be diminished. You know, so if we think about when we have tight hamstrings, tight hamstrings provides us with a limitation to the quadriceps and, you know, the hip flexors move. You know, so all of those opposing muscle balances are really what we deal with. So flexibility, you know, typically we would go into flexibility and we would say, okay, we're going to do this X routine of static stretches. You know, we're going to take you to the end range of motion. We're going to hold that. You know, so what happens when we do a, a stretching exercise? So we go in there and we do your typical flexibility routine. We're going to do a hurdle stretch. You know, what happens? So we're going to do a hurdle stretch. Let's go ahead. Do it. Get a mat, there's a mat in the cart up there. You can grab one. Let's let's go ahead and try and do a hurdler stretch. Tell me what you feel. What is a hurdler stretch? Yeah, I don't know what the hurdler stretch is. I might, but one leg's bent, one leg's out okay, straight. So stretch. Anything right here, you know, we can do this position. You know, just doing hamstring stretch. What's that? You know, we can also see them where the hurdler stretch used to be taught with the leg outside, you know, in that position. We don't do that anymore because what do you feel when you do that position? Your knee you feel is an tweaked. extreme amount of strain in the, the trail leg knee. You know, so typically we do this. So if we're doing this, where, where do you feel the stretch? Okay, do we feel it in the low back at all? Yeah. You know, so in this position, we're stretching the hamstring. You know, so we're trying to increase that, you know, mechanical flexibility, you know, the elasticity of the hamstring. So we can do this exercise, but you know what? What's the limit of this movement? So if we're doing this, does this account for only hip flexion? Does this account for pelvic rotation? What's going on here? Because now, if we do a secondary hamstring exercise, you know, so if we lie back and do you know the hamstring exercise, so just lie on your back, just lie back on your back, put your knees to your chest. What are we stretching? Low back. Low back. What else? Glutes. Glutes. Yeah, definitely glutes. I mean, if you if you pull your hand or you pull your knees to your chest as tightly as you can, do you feel that stretching the glutes? Yeah. Okay. So now, if we take one leg, keep it flat on the floor, and keep it so that we're trying to keep that. Straight leg as straight as possible, bring the knee to the chest. You know, what are we stretching? Hip flexor on one side, hamstring on the other side. You know, so now we can see where this is engaging a little bit more of that kind of you know contralateral movement pattern where we have right left leg going in opposing fashion. You know, so sometimes it's you know thinking about how we can engage a flexibility exercise for that purpose. But what what are we really improving here? Are we going to change the actual length of the muscle? No. No. So what's the purpose of this movement? So if we think about stretching exercises, what is the purpose of a stretching exercise? The warm up the muscles. Okay, so what are, what's the warm up providing us? Think about this. Okay, go back into that same exercise, lying on your back, pulling your your right leg to your chest, left leg straight down. Okay, so now you're going to place your hands behind your right thigh, and you're going to push outward toward the floor with your right leg while trying to resist that position. Try to contract as maximally as you possibly can and hold that for about 20 seconds. Okay, now relax. Now bring your knee to the chest. Do we feel a little bit greater range of motion now? What's happening? This is what we experience when we call proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, or PNF. Where basically what we're doing is we're contracting, and you find that resistance. So it's telling you, okay, this tension is developing. So when you feel that tension start to ratchet up, that's activating your proprioceptor. So the proprioceptor that's primarily involved in this is going to be your golden tendon. You get to a certain point in range of motion, and it says, 
That's all I'm going to allow. If I go any further, something catastrophic is going to happen. It shuts down everything. Well, we want to get to the point where we kind of push the buttons on the DTO, and proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation is doing that. So a lot of times you see a therapist when they're in there, and they'll have you resist against them. So you'll do a partner stretch where you'll grab a person's leg, and you'll, you'll be there, and they'll just, you know, you'll have their, their you know, calf pressing against your, your shoulder, and they're just going to push against you, push against you, push against you. And you'll feel that position where all of a sudden the muscle just kind of, and then you just go a little bit farther, controlled fashion of the stretch. You know, so what we're really engaging in here, we're not changing the length of the muscle, we're changing the coordination of the nerves. You know, so what's happening here is we're re-educating that body. The reason why we like to stretch beforehand, as I said, we're kind of cueing into the movement. This is okay to happen, you know, because if we get into a situation where we want our hamstrings loose before we run, why? We don't want to get caught up in that idea of you sprint three step bang bang, ow, 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 you pull up leg because your hamstring strength. You know, how do we create that? You know, it's a force imbalance that creates that disparity in recruitment of the hamstrings. But for the most part, what happens is because it's under such a forceful intent that the golden tendon organ is bypassed and then we go way past that and it's like, ow, 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 I just, you know, strain my hamstring, the muscle strain, and then you're going to feel that. Anybody in here ever had a really bad hamstring strain? It feels like all of a sudden it's like someone's just poured hot wax inside the muscle and it's like, yeah, that molten lava feeling, you know, where you're almost in that position where you feel like you're really going to tear the muscle. Not a fun situation to get into, you know, because it starts to feel that. Well, what that is, is that's the muscle structure starting to break down because, you know, we didn't get to the point where we allowed the nerves to do that. So we have to allow that. Because what do we see? When we go into a position, okay, go back to your stretch. Now try to put yourself in that position. Now straighten your leg that is brought towards your chest. And what just happened? Did we suddenly go into a greater or lesser position of hip flexion? Some of you will find yourself, you know, in this position, the straighter we try to keep that leg, the less hip flexion we can actually get into, you know. So in that position, now bend your knee. Is it easier to bring your, yeah. yeah. So in that position, what's happening? You know, we're having to learn that accommodation process, you know, because really what's happening is we're having to accommodate flexibility exercises. And it's really important to understand that the majority of the time when we find problems, it's in two joint muscles. You know, if you think about, it's not so much that we're going to find the, the, you know, shortness in the vastus medialis group, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus intermedius group of the quadricep. Most of the time it's going to be in that rectus femoris. You know, it's that hip flexion and knee flexion combination, hip flexion knee extension. Because they're kind of working in opposing fashions. You know, so have a seat. Question. Yes. So, are, the longer your muscles are, does that decrease your risk of injury? It's going to decrease the risk of injury because what's going to happen is we're not going to suddenly get to a position where we can't accommodate that range of motion. So if stretching can't lengthen the muscles, what can? What can lengthen the muscle? What, what causes changes in muscular length? Waste. Muscular strength. So what's going to happen is it's going to take a lot of, you know, stretching to change it because what we get into is it's the you know plastic versus elastic form of stretching to change the length of the muscle we have to change not only the elastic structures but actually the plastic structures as well you know so the elastic structures are the collagen fibers that go in the epimysium endomysium paramecium that run throughout the length of the muscle that form the tendons on both ends so that's the elastic structure so that's kind of like your bungee cord that runs through the, that the actual structures where we're changing the connectivity between actin and myosin. That's more the plastic formation of that. We have to change the angle of the neck of the, the myosin heads and everything else. So that is a little bit harder to change through just stretching alone. So one of the things we get into with the misnomers, we just think, okay, we're going to just stretch and stretch and stretch and we're going to stretch our way into greater flexibility. Well, what do we find when we were stretching? When you got to that end range of motion and you suddenly neared the position where your muscles were saying, hey, that's about as far as we can go. What happened? Started to shake. Well, what's causing that shaking? 
that's the actual muscle activation. You're starting to recruit that muscle. So that muscle is actually now starting to try to get stronger to do that, and it's usually the opposing pair. You know, so we get in there, it's like, okay, as I start to get in there, I want to shorten that muscle on the opposite side of the joint to create a greater length opportunity. So we're just kind of recalibrating the geometry of the joint. So what happens is when one muscle gets shortened because of a postural accommodation, we sit too much, our hip flexors get tight. So in that position, we tend to get our hip flexors tight. Well, what does that cause? It causes the pelvic tilt. Well, how do we change that? We actually need to work on strengthening the extensor muscles. You know, so one of the big things we disengage with in terms of fitness development is the connectivity and the responsibility for flexibility in being a muscular balance activity as much if not more so than it is a muscular length activity. So a lot of times when you get into a prescriptive element where you're talking about, okay, now we want to improve your hamstring flexibility, one of the things we engage in is, oh, well, let's go do a lot of stretching. Well, what happened when we stretched? We get to that range of motion, what happens? Hamstrings recruited, and all of a sudden it starts to lock up, it tightens up. Well, when you do that, it's going to want to get stronger and stronger and stronger. As it gets stronger, it's going to shorten, so it's going to get even tighter. So until we do something that's actually actively changing that geometry of the joint by shortening the muscle on the opposite side, thinking in coupling of pairs of muscles rather than singular activity. So one of the things we get caught up in is that we have tight hamstrings, so we stretch our hamstrings all the time. Well, we just did a hamstring stretch. Did any of you not feel the hamstrings start to, to tighten up as you got to the end range where you were near your limit of movement? Hamstring starts to tighten up, starts to you know pulsate. Well, that's the actual contraction of the muscle. Well, what is that going to do? If you do that enough, it's going to start to... So anything you do is going to have to be done in opposing pairs. So the knowledge of the pairs of muscles, when we're thinking about agonist-antagonist pairs or you know stabilizing pairs, so if we have an abductor, adductor, we don't want to do just one stretch on one side and leave the other side alone. We have to do stretches on both sides. But it has to be done in context with strengthening activities as well. You know, so the big mistake that we make is thinking about, oh, I'm going to stick you on a stretching routine because you got low back tightness and you're at the physical therapist's office. So they're just going to give you exercises to stretch your low back. doesn't do you any good if the abdominal wall is still weak. You know, if you're recruiting your abdominal wall for nothing and you're just stretching your low back, you're going to get a minimal uptick in that. And that's where, you know, the efficacy of some of our training programs are really, you know, minimalized in the sense of how good they can be. You know, because a lot of times it's like, oh, just go stretch that. You know, we got to think about stretch, stretch, stretch. Well, stretch and strengthen are the couple effect. You can't stretch one without strengthening it. You know, because then you just get laxity and then you get that muscle isolated. It's not going to change the geometry. And it has to change the actual geometry of the joint to the point where it's now in that postural alignment that's more towards the neutral position rather than being skewed towards one side or the other. So it's like, think about this. Do you go change your, how many of you have ever had your alignment done on your car? And your front end alignment done. Well, what do they do? Do they just go stretch one side? Or do they tighten the bolts on one side and loosen the bolts on another side so they recorrect that geometry? So they recorrect the geometry so you're not having to drive down the road steering like this to go straight. That's what happens in our body is we go in there thinking, oh, well, let's just change the geometry on one side of the joint without changing it on the other. And then you've got this situation where it's like it feels like it's wanting to go straight, but then all of a sudden it's really loose. You know, so it's important for us to understand how do we follow that engaged prescription for flexibility. It's not just stretch, stretch, stretch. You know, because most of us, we get caught into the paradigm where if we're going to work on flexibility, it's all about stretching exercise. And that's where now, majority of the time, we're seeing a gravitational pull away from a lot of the static stretching exercises more towards the dynamic flexibility exercises. Because dynamic flexibility is queuing into the activity. So a lot of the, the, the PNF stretches that we see and the, the SAQ warm-ups that we do, you know, are engaged to, you know, recalibrate the neurology to say, okay, this is permissible, but we do it at a lower grade level and then gradually build up closer to the movement speed, closer to the movement range of motion, 
and saying, okay, it's permissible to allow this. The body's kind of got a little bit better calibration on what its capability is at that specific moment. And as long as you stay within that, you know, prescribed parameter, you're not going to have too high a risk of injury. If you go farther than that, then you're going to kind of have things start to unravel and everything's going to, you know, kind of tumble backwards a little bit. So what we really want to think about is managing that balance. So how do we develop an exercise for improving the range of motion? How would we develop an exercise for improving the range of motion of the hamstrings? How many in here felt like their hamstrings were a little tighter than they would like? Work on your quads. We'll work on quads, you know. We'll work on that position of, you know, what does the hamstring do to the low back, you know? If the hamstring's extending that pelvis, it's kind of, you know, we want to think about abdominal work, you know. So it's that relationship of abdominals, quadriceps, low back, you know, hamstring stretching, you know. We have to think about the, the full coupling effect on all sides of the pelvis. Because if we think about it, the pelvis has actually got four points of contact. It's the abdominals, the hip flexors, the lumbosacral, spinal extensors, and then the glutes and hams acting to kind of orient that position in almost a pulley-like fashion. You know, so if we think about that, in order to achieve a greater range of motion at one portion of that, we want to influence the range of motion at the other three points of contact. You know, one of them is going to be fairly easy. So if the hamstrings are tight, you're usually going to find that, you know, something else is tight along with that. You know, so if our hamstrings are going to be tight, usually you're usually going to find a couple pair where, you know, you're going to have the abdominals are weak because the hamstrings are going to pull there. Abdominals have to kind of get a little bit offset. You know, then you're going to find the tightness elsewhere in either the hip flexors or the lumbosacral spinal extensors. You know, so if we're going to develop an exercise for improving range of motion, it has to be understood in keeping that balance of the geometry. You know, so how do we de develop a program for muscular strength? Weights. Hmm? Weights. Well, we want to be in a resistance point. So what do we need to do in order to develop muscular strength? We think about in this position, this is where we start to think about how do we recruit muscles, you know, stepping backwards into the scenario of muscles where we have the type 2 fibers, the type 1 fibers. How do we recruit those four, you know, specific force outputs? And that's where we get into the element of, you know, looking at the motor unit recruitment, also looking at the element of the frequency of stimulation. So as we start to recruit that muscle, we're going to recruit a greater and greater and greater portion of the motor units involved in it. But at a certain point in time, all of the motor units involved still doesn't top out to provide maximal force production. Usually about 70% of our muscular maximum force production is where we recruit all of the motor units. So anything less than 70%, we're not even recruiting the entire muscle. You know, so if we're doing something that's at a 50% intensity, it's going to be recruiting primarily those type 1 fibers that we were talking about when we did the postural accommodations, when we saw those, you know, stability muscles that are involved in creating postural coordination, you know, those that are controlling the postural accommodations are usually type 1 or the highly fatigable muscles that are going to be our first range and that's where we start to set, you know, our position. So when we get into this, that's where we get the theory of overload. You know, the theory of overload in exercise prescription is really talking about how do we take that to a sufficient level where we actually engage that muscle to the right outcome. You know, if we don't engage it to the right level of overload, we're not engaging that activity for the truest development. You know, one of the things you'll get into when you take the exercise you know, prescription classes, we talk about this considerably, you know, the, there's a lot of research been done recently talking about, you know, how there's a necessity to have a fitness professional involved in the implementation of programs for individuals. Because, you know, the average female will 
go into a gym setting, go up to the third floor in the rec center here, she's going to use somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40% of her warm repetition maximum as a self-initiated intensity. So at 40%, what is she really doing? Working on type 1s. She's only type 1. She hasn't recruited the whole muscle. And yet, guys, we would think, okay, guys tend to be a little bit more aggressive. They're usually referring to about 60% intensity. They're only slightly higher than females. What's the, the reason for the gap between? Why do females set a slightly lower threshold than guys? It's, it's the sociological effect where, you know, they don't want to look like a female bodybuilder. You know, the majority of women do not want to go in there and show that they're, you know, bulky and they're, you know, enormous, that they're going to be, you know, this, you know, huge, you know, thing because it's, it's not socially, you know, acceptable. It's one of those where we still do the body shaming thing. Unfortunately for certain people, that their genetic material is built that way with their endocrine system that, you know, I, I had a colleague that she was, she was more towards the inclination where she didn't really lift weights much, but, you know, she, she could develop muscle mass from rowing, biking, hiking, kayaking, you know, and, you know, she looked like she spent hours in the gym and most of hers was just pursuing outside physical activity, you know, so, you know, she was looked upon by some context sociologically as being less than feminine, you know, which is really bad because it shouldn't be the way we address it. It should be that she's an individual who's healthy. She's taking care of herself physically and, you know, in anything she can do activity-wise, but that's just her genetic makeup. But we tend to kind of skew that. So that does tend to lead, but the, the opposite end was that we used to have, you know, years ago, our volleyball players, I would see them squatting five, 600 pounds. And yet there were four of them that were Nike fitness models. And they were size fours. And squatting five to 600 pounds at the same time. And, you know, so typically we tend to think that, you know, strength comes with bulk, but for females, strength comes with how you train it and what you do. If you're trying to train that bulk, you can create that. You're going to have to really work at the opposite end of the spectrum quite a bit to change the body mass thing because that's more of a genetic material related to your endocrine system more so than it is towards the prescription type of thing. But the reality is that research says because we self-regulate so low that the majority of people who self-initiate an exercise program don't understand that they're not really getting the benefit of the exercise program to the level that they desire. So that's why, you know, so often they go in, they join a health club, they start exercising, and after a period of time, they don't start seeing the results they want. They lose that motivation, and they quit. You know, because how long is the average person engaged in a fitness program before they give up? Three weeks. 21 days is the average lifespan. So about three weeks. So for all those people who come in there and they, they want to get in shape now for summer, you know, in three weeks they're going to find themselves challenging and questioning whether or not they want to continue that because it's like, well, I've been doing this for three weeks and I don't see any change. Well, physiologically, unfortunately, the only thing we're going to see in three weeks is going to be the neurological changes, not the physiological changes. And so we haven't really given ourselves a time frame, but unfortunately, our psychology and our physiology aren't always in sync, you know, the way they should be. Sometimes we expect to see results quicker than we do because, you know, we just want that. You know, so when we're designing a, a program for muscle strength, you want to think about how we can approach that from the standpoint of using the motor unit recruitment, the frequency of stimulation, you know, where do we get that, you know, because if it's muscular strength, we're probably going to be about 80% or higher of our one rep max. Is it going to be appropriate for us to develop muscular strength if we're training at 40 to 60%? We'll see small upticks in our strength, but it's not going to be the level that we would desire. What else do we see? You know, at 40 to 60%, we're not even engaging the full muscle, so you know, when we start to do those explosive movements that we think we're developing through muscular strength, those 
aren't really brought into the, the development opportunity. You know, so if we're leaving the type 2 musculature that we recruit in our performance aspects, that's where we're leaving that gap again open for injury to creep through the doorway and allow things to there. So this is where we get into the thought, not just of overload, but specificity. So we want to make sure that the activity meets with demand. So the principle is called the SAID principle. And it's just that S-A-I-D, specific adaptation to imposed demands. So basically, what does that mean? What does specific adaptation to imposed demands mean in your understanding? Describe it back to me. You can do a certain activity after a while. Your body's going to adapt to be able to do that. And like only specifically to only that, that activity, activity. Right. and only yeah. to that. So when we're talking about movements, so if you think about, we talked about flexibility, it's only through the range of motion that we recruit. You'll see a lot of people, I mean, I had a, oh, I had a colleague who just frustrated the devil out of me because he would go do bicep curls and it's all about, you know, he'd go through partial range of motion exercises, you know, and, you know, he's a, he's a Greek guy, so, you know, if anybody knows Greek people, they're a little bit stubborn. You know, and talking to this individual, it was no use because he wasn't going to change what he was doing. But he doesn't understand that if he's only changing and doing a partial range of motion, he's only developing the muscle through that specific range of motion that he's recruiting. It's not going to get stronger throughout. It's only going to be that specific thing. So a lot of times, you know, how many of you guys in elementary, junior high, and high school PE did wall sits? What does wall sits develop? other than just a burning sensation in the thigh. So we would think, okay, in that position, we would be strengthening our quads. Well, we're, we're strengthening our quads, but at that very specific angle. So if you're sitting at 90 degrees, you get about a 3 degree plus or minus variance. So you might get development somewhere between 97 and 103 degrees a range of motion, or sorry, it would be 87 to 93 degrees range of motion if you're approximately 90 degrees at your position. So in that situation, you're not going to see muscular development at the top end or the bottom end of the movement. It's only at the, the 90 degree range of motion. So the problem is that it's only going to transfer to that specific portion of the movement. So then when you're you know in that sticking position about halfway up in the squat, and you're thinking, well, I did all these wall sits. Why can't I do this squatting motion? Because you've never strengthened that movement through that range of motion. It didn't see that. You know, so it really has to be you know, shown that entire range of motion in order to develop that entire range of motion. Because the other thing that happens, when you think about this, the reason why specificity is so you know, very demanding is that at every position of the range of motion, we're going to have different influences from stabilizers, neutralizers, fixators, agonists, and antagonists. Because if you think about the range of motion, think about, we talked about bicep curls. Let's think about bicep curls. When we want to do bicep curls, we're going to grab a dumbbell. Is it palm up, mid position, palm down? What's going to happen to the muscles we recruit in the three different positions? Palm up, we're recruiting one muscle primarily. Bicep. In the mid position, we're recruiting what? Do we have much bicep recruitment? Mostly it's brachialis. So when you're doing positions here and then you turn it over, it becomes brachialis and brachioradialis. You know, so depending upon the range of motion, we've suddenly just recruited different muscles. You know, so it's going to be very specific to the range of motion. But also, if you think about what's stabilizing those things, because if we're in this position, the pronators are helping to stabilize that palm up position. But now, the stabilizing role and that neutralizing role goes between the pronators and the bicep and supinator to control that position so that we're not pronating and supinating through that range of motion. You know, so that control and coordination, you know, that's what really makes those muscles work as a symphony of effect rather than you know a singular you know triumphant no noise from one muscle it has everything to do about the connectivity and the role of that muscle within the movement rather than okay 
we're going to go do this. So if we go in there and we want to train muscle by muscle by muscle, we're going to train somebody who, you know, it's not the most sociologically correct, so don't crucify me for the statement, but the old adage was, look like Tarzan, play like Jim. It was the insinuation that, you know, you would, you would look like you're a bodybuilder and you would look like you're healthy and fit, but you wouldn't connect up with that performance. But I'll tell you this, most females actually have better body control and movement than most males do. So it's almost a compliment to say you play like Jim, and, you know. So it's a bad analogy, but it's the, the thing that you, you have that disconnect between what you physiologically look like, you know. So it's like, you know, the, the raging debate for the last probably 15, 20 years in the industry up till, I would say, 2010, was cosmetic versus functional. You know, what what is most important? Functional. You know, well, functional is going to be guided by stability. It's going to be guided by that recruitment of the muscles in their specific roles expected. You know, so that's where we get into specificity because, you know, it's all about specificity. If you're not recruiting in the same way, but it also goes deeper. So when you get into exercise physiology, if you're training for, you know, your cardiovascular endurance, you know, say you want to run a marathon, you know, it's not going to give you the same return on your effort if your cardiovascular training is on a stationary button. Because you're not recruiting all of the muscles in the same pattern to burn the fuel the same way. So physiologically, or it's also biomechanically in that specificity role. So, you know, really what we have to think about is Use it as you would expect to, and that's how you should train it. You know, so in that situation, it's you know really that the principles of overload and specificity are two of our largest overarching concepts in the fitness industry. About knowing that we have to reach a certain threshold for a muscle to become active and for it to be, you know, stimulated in the right way, and then recruit it specific to the task that we intend to use it. So that's how we think about describing exercise programs for muscle strength. So look at identifying advantages and disadvantages of each type of muscle strength and endurance program. You know, so if we're doing, you know, a, what are some different types of muscular strength programs? Hmm? Okay, so we can do resistance bands. So what happens in a resistance band? Great concept. Well, let's take a break, grab some resistance bands, and we've got some weights in here, and we're going to experience the difference. So we'll take a couple minute break, and then we'll come back in here. And we're going to play with this. What's the color difference? Okay, the color difference is so pink is the lightest, green is going to be the next, and then gray is going to be the slowest. I'm oh, sorry, 